Thanks, Lisa. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know about a warm welcome. I'm here in sunny St. Louis where like it's about negative 50 outside right now. Very long, cold, crummy weather. Anyway, these webinars are awesome. Here I am sitting here drinking iced tea and eating Cecil Whitaker's pizza. Um, thank you all very much for taking your precious time to join us. Um, I want to thank, first of all, Catapult, um, who's uh, I'm proud to be a member of, some great speakers, the best CE in dentistry, um, and also to Bisco, uh, truly one of the great family-run companies in all of dentistry. So tonight, cementation sanity. So many choices, so little time, it gets confusing out there. So I want to try to make it as simple as possible for you, um, even so a guy can Missouri from Missouri can understand it. So when we talk about... Um, the materials and stuff today, we want to make sure that um, we have uh, a easy, understand, simple, repeatable, um, successful program that gives good aesthetics, but just as important, uh, great long-lasting restorations that look great. The three materials that you and I use the most today with indirect restorative dentistry is li our lithium disilicate, and then two types of zirconia, anterior zirconia and posterior zirconia. A little bit of background on all of those. Lithium disilicate, Emax, uh, has been around for quite a few years now. It's beautiful, it's long lasting, um, it's fantastic, and if cemented well, it is truly a great, great service to the patient. Zirconia came out and it added some security uh, to what we do as far as strength. Um, and there's two major types of zirconia today. There's an anterior, which has a fluctual strength of about uh, 800 megapascals, and posterior zirconia, which has a fluctual strength between 1,000 um, and 1,200. And those are the three materials we're going to talk about mostly today. And I don't know about you and I, but um, uh, I don't know about you, I'm sorry, but myself, there's nothing worse than me doing a crown on a patient and a uh, year, two, five years later, it breaks, comes out. There's nothing worse than a patient walking into your office, carrying in their palm that brand new $1,000 crown that you just did on them, where it breaks or becomes um, separated from the tooth, the core comes out and it stays inside the crown. There's nothing worse than that. Doc, it was never a problem until you fixed it. So the goal tonight is to make it sim simplistic, but very repeatable and uh, something that um, we can all use in our practice every day. The goal is durable, aesthetic, and comfortable restorations. Everything I tell you today is something that we do every day in our office. So I work, um, I own uh, several practices in St. Louis. I work full time. I see patients four days a week, and then I often teach on Fridays, uh, do a few webinars mixed in. So everything I'm telling you is a mixture of a busy clinical practice plus um, the research and uh, a lot of the reading I do. So if we could look at this, all things being equal, if our rest restorative materials can have a positive influence on the oral environment, shouldn't they? Everything we put in the human body has some sort of effect, uh, positive or negative. There's very few things that have zero effect. So all things being equal, it makes sense that if we could have a material materials that have a positive influence on the oral environment, that's what we should strive for. Cementation is what we're talking about tonight, and there are several materials that we've used extensively in our practices. Um, and these are a category of cements that I call regenerative. The reason I call them regenerative is because there's a lot of confusion um, in, uh, in dentistry today about bioactivity, and what we define as being um, a bioactive material. So let's just break it down to real simple um, terms. So uh, again, hey, there's a test afterwards. Don't forget to take that test. You get some CE credits. So, uh, and those test questions are very, very hard. So you might wanna take notes. Uh, I made them up. You know they can't be hard. Ionic exchange. It's the exchange of, of ions between the material and the tooth or saliva that might lead to repair of dentinal tissues. So in other words, if our materials can give off some ions, they go into the saliva or into the tooth and create an environment where tissues can heal. That's regenerative dentistry, and that's what we're talking about today. I don't want you to get hung up too much on the definitions, but it's important to know um, what they mean, at least the basics. 
bioactive is a buzzword. It is a marketing hype uh, word that's used all over in dentistry today um, and in medical materials in general. Um, but it's an important to know the difference between it and some other words that are um, probably more applicable to what we do in dentistry today. Bioactive simply means to elicit a response from a living tissue. Now, if we put that into dental words, it's to elicit a response at the interface of the material and the tooth. In parentheses, you see there, which results in the formation of a bond between the tissues and the material. And that's where it all gets confusing. So does a bioactive dental material have to form a bond with the tooth? We'll come back to that in a little while. The next word is biointeractive, and that's the ability of a material that, to release ions, and uh, that goes into the saliva, um, and that may stimulate remineralization of a tooth or help repair tissues. So bioactive, biointeractive. Um, I don't want you to get hung up too much on the uh, words, uh, so I want to just go over some materials with you. When we look at the list of the regenerative type materials, the bioactive dental materials, if you will, one of them that's been around the most, um, the longest, is Theracal. A lot of you have used that before. This is truly a, a phenomenal material, if used correctly. Theracal is based on Portland cement. It's a resin-modified calcium silicate that releases high levels of, of uh, calcium ions, and it leads to secondary dentin formation. It's based on MTA. And so MTA, as you know, in the endodontic world, is what your endodontist friends use to fix perforations and do apicoectomies and to repair tooth structure. Um, Theracal has an early high alkalinity of a pH of 11 or so and it neutralizes um, and it's antimicrobial, it has a minor bond to dentin. So based on that formulation, Bisco came out with Theracem. What is it? It's a self-adhesive dual cure resin cement. Now there's lots of self-adhesive dual cure resin cements on the market. SpeedSem, MaxSem, Unisem, SmartSem, uh, beauty sum. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them, and I know you've used probably at least one of those type materials, um, and those are all good products, and especially when we talk about lithium desilicate in a few minutes, very, very popular. A um, couple of things that differentiate Theracem from those products. Uh, first of all, it is a self-adhesive resin cement, and it is dual cure. Here's something that differentiates it from a lot of those other products I just mentioned. It's very easy to clean up. And I don't know about you, maybe I'm the only one. Um, I leave cement once in a while, and my hygienists will start cussing me out, they'll stop throwing scalers at me, that kind of thing. Nothing worse than that. So if we can have a cement that has great retention, great physical properties, and it's easy to clean up, that alone would be a reason to consider, um, at least consider another cement. It's also radiopaque, it's got a good bond to almost, almost everything. There's no etch, no primer, no bonding agents needed. It's acidic to begin with, and then it turns basic in just a short short amount of time. The reason it has to be acidic is that's where we get our self-etching, self-bonding um, to, but our uh, pH has to neutralize with time. Then the last sentence on there, what differentiates that really between those other cements I just mentioned is a great release of fluoride and calcium. That's where we separate ourselves. Calcium is a wonderful ion that we that you see a lot in the research today. We've all considered fluoride in the past. Fluoride is a feel-good thing. It makes us feel good. We put something in the patient's mouth that releases fluoride, and that's a good, good thing. But if we can add calcium to it, we get some other advantages that go along with it. Theracem's been reviewed and uh, been positively uh, um, analyzed by a lot of people who have tried it, uh, the dental advisor, Catapult, um, both very high regards to these. And so when we talk about this cement, I want to make sure we understand when to use it, uh, when not to use it. Generally speaking, when we choose a cement, we choose it according to these three things. Number one, what material are we using? Number two, what kind of aesthetics do we need? Does it have to blend in very well with the, the color of the tooth? Uh, Will it influence the color of my restoration? And thirdly is the retention. Those things have to play into, uh, in, into our mind when we consider what kind of cements to use. When we look at lithium disilicate, when I talk about that in just a few minutes, I'm going to recommend that you, at the very minimum, 
use a self-adhesive dual cure resin cement. When we talk about the two types of zirconia, I'm going to recommend that you use anything you want. We use Therasem for all of those products, and I'll explain as we go. Now, some dentists are just gifted. As you look at these two molars on this picture um, and the, the endo that was supposedly done on both the teeth, um, I'm amazed that that dentist could get an impression of that second molar that far subgingival. So that's gifted. I don't have that talent. Um, I'm, of course, I'm just kidding. And I don't mean to make fun of any dentist out there. We all try as hard as we can. And if we go to bed at night knowing that we did the best job we could, given that circumstance, then we'll have a rewarding career. But when I look at these, uh, some of this stuff, um, I see things that we have to ask ourselves. First of all, did we pick the right material? Secondly, did we prep the tooth right? Um, and thirdly, did we understand what we are doing? Um, when we look at things like this, um, obviously somebody left some cement there, but that's not the only problem, obviously. Um, how they got an impression down there and got that Emax down that far, I don't know. I'm not that good. Does it matter what cement you use if your prep is lousy? Uh, so let me back up just a second. When bonding came out, it almost sounded like the bonding people were telling us, you can almost do whatever you want preparation-wise. Your cement's going to make it, take up the slack. In other words, you can be as lousy as you want, and your great cement's going to save you. You know what? That is not true. In this case, where a lithium disilicate crown was done, it was cemented with Unisem. Did the cement really matter? Mm, not so much. When you do these crowns and do these materials, and you, if you look closely at this slide, you've got about a half a millimeter or so thickness of lithium disilicate, about another half a millimeter or so thickness of Unisem. You know what? It didn't matter what cement this person used. The prep wasn't good or the uh, adjusting of the lithium disilicate wasn't good. Something didn't work out in this case, and the thickness of the of restoration wasn't sufficient. It wouldn't have mattered what cement they used. Zirconia bridges. Sometimes we look at these and we kind of analyze what's going on. When they fracture, they often fracture at the connector or they fracture um, sometimes on the abutment. And usually it's about the thickness of the abutment or the width and thickness of the connector on the bridge. So again, if the work is not very good. In other words, if the preparation's not good and if the lab work's not good, it doesn't really matter what cement you use. So I don't want to mislead you that some is going to save every situation for you regardless of how the dentistry or the lab work is because it won't. It still comes down to reasonable dentistry. And so when we look at these materials, I just want you to understand that we look at the good and the bad and the ugly and try to figure out what's working and what's not working. Um, and then we go from there. Great cementation cannot, cannot overcome a poor prep. So again, it still comes back to you and I. So cementation sanity. Let's try to make sense of all this. Uh, so here's a picture I took out the backyard of my house today. Mm, no, not really. So that is French Polynesia somewhere. Here's the back of my house. We have had a lousy, crummy, cold winter. I mean, like, this is the worst winter. I understand why people move to Florida now. Some of you are probably listening from Florida. I'm jealous. Um, but we've had a lot of snow. We've had some bad weather. My hands are freezing cold right now even. So um, it was sunny today, though, and that makes me feel better. The, everybody's moods up a little bit whenever the sun comes out. Um, there's my dog, Bentley. We'll talk about him in just a few minutes. Um, but anyway, the material, the aesthetics, the retention, they determine whether we use a regular cement or whether we bond a restoration in. Cement, regular old glass ionomer cement, resin modified glass ionomer cements, zinc phosphates, polycarboxylates, those are cements. Bond, self-adhesive dual cure resin cements or a dual cure resin with a bonding agent. So we kind of have to distinguish between the two and understand that the material, the aesthetics and the retention all determine when we're gonna use which. Let's talk about Emacs first, Emacs. Whenever we use Emacs, we have had a situation in our office where we did about 10,000 restorations of Emacs in 11 years. And we saw uh, a pretty good percentage of failure rate um, with those cemented with a resin modified glass ionomer. Now, I'm not here to tell you that your, all your restorations are gonna fail in Emacs if you cemented them 
with a glass ionomer or a resin modified glass ionomer. I'm not telling you that at all. Don't worry about that. If your prep is good and the material is thick enough, you'll have good clinical success. But what we've learned with time is that we have better clinical success with Emacs if we use, at the very minimum, a self-adhesive dual cure resin cement. With zirconia, we can use almost anything we want to cement them with, and they work out well, again, if the preparation is good. Zirconia, it's very durable. Your preparation is similar to gold, whatever it is you're thinking in your mind about gold. Um, CAD cam, it's digital impressions, perfect for it. You can cement or bond. And you get a fast turnaround from the lab normally if you don't put layering porcelain on it. And is it a total porcelain fused to metal replacement? Maybe, maybe not. It's also inexpensive. So um, I am involved in a dental laboratory, so I kind of look at it from both sides. Um, so we'll kind of give you that as we go here. In this case, these are zirconia crowns. These are monolithic zirconia. There is no layering porcelain on them at all. One of them is a posterior zirconia crown, a bicuspid, and one of them is an anterior zirconia crown. So there's different names for these materials, but uh, traditional Bruxer type crowns, zirconia, um, they're what we're going to call posterior zirconia. They're the original zirconias. They were a little bit more opaque, um, less translucent. Um, not quite as real looking. When anterior zirconia came out, not quite the same flexural strength, but certainly better aesthetics, more translucent. When we cement them, we use Therosem for almost every single one of them nowadays. The point I wanna make about Therosem, this is the first time I've showed you the cement, it is kind of white looking. Uh, that's because of the calcium in it. And whenever we have high levels of calcium, um, it appears white to you, especially when it's thick, however, when the film thickness is reasonable, and that is something that fits fairly well, 100 microns, even a little more, um, your, uh, the influence of the color is negligible, even on anterior zirconia crowns. So the cuspid is an anterior zirconia, the, second bi or the first bicuspid is a um, posterior zirconia crown, and my point here is that the influence of the cement is negligible on the final color. Now those are non-layered crowns. Those are not high-end aesthetic uh, crowns. I couldn't have gotten my accreditation with the American Board of Aesthetic Dentistry using that material. Uh, but for everyday dentistry, we cement that with Therosem. Therosem on the top right photo, very easy to clean up. It usually peels off in one piece on the buckle, one piece on the lingual, and then very easy to get out interproximally. Here's another case with anterior zirconia about 700, maybe 800 megapascals of flexural strength. It's more translucent than the traditional posterior zirconia. We use anterior zirconia anytime we have a posterior tooth that shows in a smile. In other words, we use anterior zirconia on anterior teeth and on bicuspids. We do layer it once in a while, but in this case, that's monolithic. There is no layering porcelain on it. Therosem gives a very good bond to zirconia without primers, without adhesives. And we get a great everyday clinical success with this. In this case, we're gonna take an impression. We're gonna um, make our, temp for routine temporaries, which is a very important part of your crown and bridge, of course, um, we'll take a alginate substitute impression first. This is silginate. Um, and then our crown and bridge, our temporary material, this is from Visco, it's called Pro CNB. It's a wonderful new temporary material, um, just uh, incredible. So when we do this, we fill up our triple tray. We have the patient bite into our alginate substitute, and that's how we start the case before we prep the tooth. That's gonna be used for our temporary, of course. Uh, when we make our temporary, put the tip of your temporary um, mixer at the bottom of the prep. In other words, touch it against the silginate squeeze and allow that crown to fill up with the material without lifting the tip up and down and up and down because every time you do that you get air voids uh, inside the material. Now let's cement the crown, anterior zirconia like I said. Uh, we clean the tooth, we just wipe it off with a two by two and then we cement the crown with Therosem. We have the patient bite on a cotton roll. We tell them firm but not hard. Yeah, I don't even know what that means either. Uh, but what we do is we Try the crown in, uh, we clean the crown, which I'll go over in just a minute, 
and then we cement with Therasem. Very easy, very predictable, um, very good results. So the bicuspid here has no layering porcelain on it. It just has some stain down at the gingival half, and then that is anterior zirconia cemented with Therasem. So as you can see, even with the more translucent zirconia, Therasem does not uh, influence the final color of that restoration. Compared to the old porcelain fused to metal crown next to it, and in the other picture, in the occlusal picture, the old porcelain fused to metal crowns on the uh, upper, uh, no comparison. Doing anterior zirconia, even posterior zirconia now, cemented with Therasem, it blows them away. Oh, here's my dog. Uh, so I've raised golden retrievers, and I've had a couple chocolate labs. Um, these dogs are phenomenal. I know he looks stupid. Well, well, he is, uh, but he is intelligent too. He's trainable, um, unlike my kids were. So this is Bentley, and I don't want to say his name too loud because he's sitting right here. He might start attacking me, biting my cord, or licking me. Sorry. Uh, here's Bentley at the pool this summer. And um, so we had a very hot summer last summer. Like I said, this winter has been very cold, and uh, Bentley likes to go swimming. And he lays in the pool just to keep cool and we were having our uh, the pump on our pool fixed and um, um, the guy who was working on the pump called me and said Jack I'm sending you a invoice for your pump I said yeah okay great and then he said uh, I'm also sending you a release to have your dog uh, we're gonna use him uh, on our website uh, I said what he said yeah when our technician was replacing the pump on your pool we are to splash uh, and then we saw your dog out there surfing in the water and what he does is he gets a, a raft and he sits on his raft out in the pool and um, he can stand on that raft for a, a long time. Uh, he just kind of floats around and everything. Uh, he's right on cue. I'm sorry. Um, and then here he is in the pool getting some sun. He's cared, he cares about UV rays and so he wears um, UV sunglasses and a hat. Um, he was a yellow lab before he started tanning. So now he's a chocolate lab. So let's do uh, a little bit of different kind of work. Let's do a bridge and a bone graft and show you how we use Therasem even in a more complex case. One of the things we look for uh, in a cement is biofriendliness. In other words, does it irritate tissues just by itself? Uh, of course, if you left a lot of cement subgingival, um, you would get irritation of the soft tissue. Of course you would. Um, but by nature, is it biotolerant? Is it biofriendly? So in this case, we have a lady, uh, sent her to the endodontist. She had a failing endo, and we suspected a fractured root, regardless, um, deemed unsavable by the endodontist. She did not want an implant. So we do implants in our practice. Of course, that's always my first choice. Uh, in this case, though, we have a tooth that's going to be extracted. Let's go through the case real quick. The first thing we're going to do is a little mock-up. I take some old uh, composite. Put them on the tooth, um, and we're going to use that as our temporary um, uh, buildup, if you will. Now we're going to take a sildenafil impression, and then we're going to prep our teeth. Whenever we do an anterior bridge or several anterior teeth, um, the worst thing that we could do is somehow lose our occlusion. So whenever we do an anterior case, we always leave one tooth not prepped. So even if I was doing all the lowers or if I was doing all the uppers, I leave one upper anterior tooth not prepped, and if I was doing the lowers, the same, so that when the patient bites, we maintain our occlusion. That way we can get our bite registration at that point without altering our, um, our bite. In this case, we extracted the tooth after we got our impression, our bite registration there. We're going to make a temporary. So as you can see where we took the tooth out, we've got um, a bit of a wound there. We're gonna use our temporary matrix and make a temporary. Now that temporary right there by itself is not very good. Uh, it would be irritating to the tissue. Our goal in this case is to support the soft tissue so it doesn't collapse. And then to use materials that aren't irritating to the tissues. That's where we're going with this case. As you can see on the bottom right photo, that's an ovate pontic. We contour the pontic and add some flowable composite. And then um, we make it 100% round in all directions. We try it in the mouth to make sure it doesn't put too much pressure on the papilla. One of the worst things we can do in crown and bridge is if we extract a tooth and then allow the soft tissues to just do whatever they want. So in other words, we maintain pressure on the tissues and that keeps the papilla sharp and in place. Um, so in other words, if we were to extract that tooth and just let the patient go home without a temporary in there, we would lose the papilla, we would get a little bit more resorption than we would if we did the following procedure. 
We try in our temporary here, we notice a little bit of blanching on the soft tissue, very little bit. We don't want excessive blanching that could cause recession. In this case, we're gonna play some um, graft material in the socket, way beyond the scope of this webinar to go over grafting. Uh, but in this case, uh, we're gonna place our graft material loosely in the socket, but we're gonna pack it in there, not tightly though, because we want blood to go in between the granules. Uh, and then we're gonna take some collagen tape, very inexpensive. Um, if you notice on that lower right picture, I use my scissors on there and you can tell that I failed scissor uh, use in kindergarten. I totally failed that class. My symmetry is not good. You can do better than I can. So we kind of cut it into a figure eight pattern where it kind of fits interproximally, excuse me, where it fits where the pontic is. It goes over the graft material and then we cement our temporary bridge over the collagen tape that is over the graft material. So let me back up. We fill the extraction site with graft material. We put collagen tape over the graft. Then we cement the temporary bridge on top of the collagen tape. What the collagen tape does, it keeps my graft from moving. It also keeps my temporary cement from going into the extraction site on top of the graft material. And since collagen tape is resorbable, resorbable it allows the egress or the, the uh, epithelial tissue to grow right over my graft material. So in this case, I cleaned up the cement a bit and then I cut with scissors the collagen tape. We tell the patient that they're gonna feel that on there. We don't want them to yank that out, um, but they're gonna feel that a little bit. No problem with that. On the lingual, the same thing, it's hanging out on the lingual. And uh, we cut that, we let the patient know, yeah, you're gonna feel it with your tongue, but don't mess with it too much. It's doing fine there. We'd like that to stay in there uh, for several days to allow the epithelium to start doing its thing. So here we are six weeks later, temporary in place, graft material taking. Notice that we've lost a slight bit of the papilla. So we're not doing magic here. Uh, we're just maintaining tissue, uh, regenerative dentistry, if you will. So one of the big important things about our regenerative dentistry is the cement we use. In this case, we're gonna, after six or eight weeks, whatever you choose, we're gonna do our final preparations, take our impression for the lab, get a preparation color for the lab so that they can choose what material to use. In this case, we're gonna use all anterior zirconia with no layering porcelain. Again, would this pass um, the boards for the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry? No, it would not. Uh, this is an everyday functional case in our office. Um, in Missouri, we don't, get, um, uh, we don't get paid all that well for some of these cases. Not that that makes a great big difference uh, in my material choice, um, but still, um, I want the best job that I can um, meeting the needs of that patient. In this case, anterior zirconia, an ovoid pontic, 100% convex, and we're going to cement the case with their SM. Notice my ponting is 100% round. Let's suppose that I used one of the other self-adhesive dual cure resins on the market, Speed SEM, Smart SEM, Max SEM, um, Unisem, nothing against those materials, but supposing you accidentally leave some under the gums, that causes inflammation. That could cause a recession or resorption or a relapse of my papilla. Um, certainly it's not wanted, we know that. So using a cement that's easy to clean up, that's bio-friendly or not, at least not bio-irritating by itself, um, that's very advantageous. And if we can peel it off in one or two, uh, just, just a short amount of time, that's perfect. So when we clean this cement up, um, it peels off from the facial and from the lingual. Like I said, we take a CH3 Explorer and I push down in approximately and the cement just kind of pops off. Now this is monolithic uh, zirconia. There is no layering porcelain here. We absolutely could have done a better job if we would have layered it, absolutely. Um, but in this case, um, we didn't. So just kind of showing you the possibility if we're using materials that are uh, bio-friendly by nature. And uh, like I said, there are some certainly, certainly one of those. Oh yeah, and that's what I hear all the time. You know, this, this material is revolutionary. This material will change your life. Will it? Mm, let's not go too far. But there is something that will change your life. Now this is true. I, somebody's got to do it, I know. But I got to speak in Kauai, in Hawaii a, a couple weeks ago. And uh, we stayed at a nice hotel. And I had never seen this before. This will change your life. I had never seen this before. This is Kauai. We went hiking and all. And there was a lot of rain out there as well. 
And so my clothes were getting wet and everything, but this happened to be a sunny day in Kauai. Um, I can't believe it. In the hotel we were staying in, I saw this. I had no idea these even existed. Is it just a seat? No. There's a heater, a cleaner, a dryer. I never heard of that in Missouri. We don't, generally speaking in Missouri, you do not plug a toilet seat in. I'm just telling you, it doesn't happen. I saw like this thing next to it, I was all excited. I could not leave that restroom. There's all kinds of switches and stuff, and I didn't even know what all this stuff means. Uh, but my, like I said, we were hiking, and we had a lot of rain and stuff, and my shirt got wet. So I thought, well, um, it's got a dryer on it. So I set my shirt on there. You know what? That shirt was toasty, warm, and dry in about 15 minutes. So that thing is awesome. That will change your life. So in Catapult, like I said, uh, great group of speakers. Um, I belong to Catapult. I'm fortunate to be in that group. Here's one of the quotes uh, when they reviewed Therasem. Probably the best cement in dentistry today. It's easy cleanup, make it great for implant crowns. It's aesthetics and simple delivery system make it perfect for routine indirect restoratives. All this while being biofriendly with high calcium release. So I couldn't say it better. Yeah, so no, the winter's been terrible, like I told you. So I was doing a little bit of painting at the office. I took my dog with me at one point. Uh, and I looked over and I saw a great big white stain in the carpet. Somebody got in the paint. Now it was just me and him at the office. I looked at him and said, hey, did you get in the paint? And he said, no, it wasn't me. But the evidence says otherwise. So I don't believe him quite as much as I used to. Evidence-based dentistry is where we're at today. Here's a good example of what I'm talking about. Um, this young man, uh, he got his life straightened out. This is awesome. When we see cases like this, one of the things that you and I must ask ourselves, uh, first of all, how do we fix this? Um, secondly, uh, what's the cause of this? So that, again, beyond the scope of this webinar, but when we see rampant, recurrent decay, worn dentition, particularly in um, the younger population, we have to ask ourselves, what's the cause of this? Hmm. He's getting married soon in this case, and so we're gonna fix him, fix him up a little bit. He doesn't have the money to do all his teeth, so we'll just do some uppers. We're going to do some fillings on the lower, but we'll do indirects on the uppers. So what materials are you going to use? What cements are you going to use? How are you going to manage this case so that you get a good, long-lasting result? This is monolithic anterior zirconia, no layering porcelain. I want to, I stress that because, um, yes, you could make zirconia look better by putting layering porcelain on there. Now, he's a young man, and we let him pick his own color out. I don't remember the shade of this. I think it's 0M3. Um, but regardless, he's getting his life turned around. He's getting things back uh, uh, back where they should be, and we're going to prep the case and do our thing. Whenever we try in crowns or veneers and we get them contaminated, again, this is zirconia, we get blood on them or saliva. We get uh, proteins and phosphates on the crown, and uh, how do you get them off there? Well, most most of us, honestly, most of us just hold it, um, over our suction and we rinse it and then we dry it and we hope we don't suck it up in the suction um, That's how you and I live. I know that but whenever we want maximum adhesion We want to make sure we get the blood uh, the proteins the salivary stuff off there um, And using a cleaner really helps in that regard in this case. We're going to use Zerclean on there Zerclean is a zirconia cleaner. It also works well on ceramics like lithium disilicate, which we're going to get to in a minute um, and uh, there's a special nuance when you use it on a ceramic like lithium disilicate, but on zirconia, we place it on there for a minute or so and rinse it off, and then we have a nice, clean surface that we can get maximum adhesion to. In this case, we're going to cement them all with um, Therasem, and Therasem is a dual cure material. It is light cured and it's chemical cured. Now, this is just Jack's beacon here. Uh, a lot of the research I read a few years ago said that if I allow the chemical cure to start happening first, I would get a better conversion. In other words, we used to hold a light three inches for three seconds from a dual cure resin cement. We called that flash curing. Flash curing was a great thing in that we could start cleaning up the cement without it. Uh, without it being too difficult. So we could flash cure it and then start cleaning it up before it got too hard and approximately. You know what? We don't do that. It, it, there's a couple of reasons we don't because some of the literature told me it was best to let the chemical cure start happening first 
And then also with Therosim, we don't have to worry about being hard to clean up because it's not. Um, I can allow the chemical cure to start happening and it depends on the humidity and the temperature of your office, of course. When I have the patient seat the crowns and when I seat the crowns and I have the patient bite on cotton or if I'm holding it with my hands, um, we usually start the cleanup process uh, in about 45 seconds or so. Um, and what I do is I take my CH3 Explorer or my 204S scaler and I push down interproximally towards the gums um, on the Therosem and that kind of pushes it away from the tooth and then I peel it off like that lower left picture shows usually in one piece. So again, this is anterior zirconia, a shade picked by the patient. Again, he's a young guy um, trying to provide regenerative dentistry, give him the longest lasting best result we can. Um, the minimum, so we use the strongest material that meets the minimum cosmetic need of the patient. So he got married with his life being turned around. I assume he'll get the rest of his work done at some point. On the bottom, on that lower left picture, you see some dark restorations. And uh, the darkness is from um, sodium, di silver diamine fluoride. And uh, again, uh, that's for another webinar sometime. So again, using materials that are bio-friendly, um, some iron release, calcium and fluoride to reduce the chances of recurrent decay, reduce the chance of plaque and bacteria accumulation, and we get a great soft tissue response. So again, that's what we're looking for in the materials we use. Again, we're sold on using these materials. So again, I gotta get back to basic dentistry, how you do your preps, choosing the right materials, and then um, delivering them correctly. That's what it takes. You can no, never over prep. Let's do a different kind of case. Uh, let's do some ceramic veneers, in this case, lithium disilicate, and some zirconia all at the same time. So let's see how we do this together. And this lady, um, she's got some recurrent decay, which you'll see in a second. She's got some old dental work done here. Um, she's got an old PFM. She's got some veneers that to me don't look like they were sat totally, perhaps. And then she's got some decay in her proximally, as you can see. So what materials are you gonna use? Uh, what restorative uh, materials are you gonna use for your restorations? What cement are you gonna use? Uh, do you have to use the same material for all these teeth? Can you get different materials to match? So there's lots of important questions you have to ask. And of course, in this case, what we're doing first is removing the disease. We're getting rid of the decay. Uh, strongly believe in caries indicator. In this case, we're gonna use a universal bonding agent and then build these teeth up. In this case, it's with a material called Activa. Um, All Bond Universal has been our go-to bonding agent. You couldn't get me to change for anything at this point. The dual cure nature of it makes it truly universal. Um, and then uh, we get a real good color and good long lasting uh, uh, buildups with this material. We're gonna pack cord in this case. We're gonna take our final impressions like we talked about earlier. And now we're gonna get layered um, zirconia back. So on the anterior teeth, so on the incisors, that is layered zirconia. But the veneers on the cuspid and the bicuspid, those are lithium disilicate. So let's see how we're gonna try these in. The first thing we're gonna do is take our layered zirconia. We're gonna try them in with a try in medium. We're gonna rinse them off and then we're gonna apply zirclean on them. Rinse off the zirclean and then we have to reapply the siling. So we'll go over that again in just a second. But with lithium disilicate, we have to ask ourselves, what are we gonna cement them with? Again, in my, my experience, I would not use a resin modified glass ionomer anymore for lithium disilicate. Uh, we found a failure rate of about 10% um, after between five and seven years. And so uh, all I'm saying is, is that whenever we cemented them with a resin modified, or excuse me, with a dual cure resin cement like Therosem, we did not have near that much failure rate. So again, when we try in lithium disilicate, we're going to rinse off the contaminants inside, then we're gonna apply Zerclean, rinse that off, and then we're gonna reapply the silane and then cement with Therosem on a lithium disilicate crown. On Zirconia, we're gonna do the same thing without the silane. So we use Zerclean to clean off the contaminants after we try in the Zirconia crowns, and then we're gonna cement with Therosem. In this case, we're gonna wipe the tooth off with a two by two. We use a gauze that is unfilled, so not the little um, woven fibers inside there, so that we don't leave a lot of stuff on the teeth. 
we're going to put in our layered zirconia and we're going to cement them with Therasem. And as you can see, the Therasem pushes away from the inner proximal. So just above the papilla, we push down and then it kind of separates off the tooth. In my office, that's about 45 seconds or so. And then um, we clean that up. Now, again, I told you that we allow the chemical cure to happen first with the um, Therasem. But after we're finished cementing and after we're finishing cleaning up, then we shine a light at the margins. So again, in my mind, the research shows me that if I allow the chemical cure to happen first, and this is debatable, if I allow the chemical cure to happen first and then clean it up, and then light cure the margins, I get the best polymerization I can with it. For Emacs veneers, for lithium disilicate veneers, again, lithium disilicate is a real porcelain. It is a silica-based material. It has to be hydrofluoric acid etched and silinated. Zirconia we treat as a metal, but lithium disilicate is an actual ceramic silica-based material. Because veneers, uh, we want maximum aesthetics and we want a, as much working time as we can to clean things up. We cement those with a light cure only cement still. And we use Choice 2, which is a fantastic product. So again, for our veneers, we use a total etch technique, a universal bonding agent, and then cement with a light cured cement. That gives us the best aesthetics possible, the most working time possible. And if we wanted to influence the final uh, color of our veneer, we certainly could do that at that point. So here's our veneers. They've been etched by the lab and silane's been applied. After I try them in, um, I'm going to clean them again with Zerclean, rinse off the Zerclean and reapply the silane. On the teeth, we're going to use pumice and rinse them off. And then we're going to use a total etch technique, a universal bonding Um, and then we apply our choice to looting cement right to the tooth. And the reason we don't put the veneer cement on the veneer anymore is because I dropped too many of them. I don't know about you. I've dropped them. I've rolled over them with my chair. I've sucked them up in the suction. I've done all kinds of wild stuff with veneers. Um, but we try to drop as few as possible. Um, but uh, we put the cement on the tooth, and that keeps me from dropping as many. And then we seat the veneer right on top of the cement. My assistant brushes the cement away. I brush the cement away. So the anterior teeth, the four, the four incisors are layered zirconia. The veneers on the first bicuspid and cuspid are Emacs. So again, how did we cement them? I showed you the reasons that we use Therasem for our crowns, our Emacs crowns and our zirconia crowns. But for veneers, we still like the control of using a um, light cured cement. Um, I was addicted to the hokey pokey, but I turned myself around. So again, I'm not telling you you have to switch all your materials. I, I don't want to imply that at all. I'm just trying to give you what works in a busy clinical situation, cost effective materials that have great clinical performance. And that's what we're going for. Let's do one more case. Let's do a crown and some veneers the opposite way. So let's do some Emacs stuff. Um, I'll show you what I'm talking about. So in this lady, she had some stuff come out. So she had some dentistry, and sometimes the last person you believe is the patient. But she had some dentistry done just a couple of years ago, she said. Um, and it looks to me like she had some veneers done and a, and a full crown and some stuff failed on her. Again, I, whatever was done, um, it doesn't matter to me what the dentist did. I'm sure the dentist tried very hard, but I certainly want my stuff to last for a long time, and I know you do too. Uh, we all want to do the best. We got a necrotic tooth there on one of the central incisors. You can see she had some um, endodontic surgery done above that tooth. And so that's an old necrotic tooth. Um, so what are we going to use? What materials are we going to use? How are we going to prep the teeth? We want to be as conservative as, as we can. And some of you think that because you have uh, two crown preps on the centrals, that you would never get the laterals to match unless you did crowns on those as well. So um, again, I, I hear you, what you're saying. You're thinking that I can't put veneers next to crowns and get them to look the same. I'm not sure that that's true anymore, particularly if you're picking the right lab. Um, but I would never cut down those other teeth just because she had two crowns in the front teeth. Just wouldn't do that. These are Emacs crowns. Again, we're going to try them in. We're going to clean them with our Zerclean, rinse off the Zerclean, reapply silane. We're going to cement those full Emacs crowns on the anterior teeth with Therasem. 
hold them in place and then we're going to clean up just like we did before again these are emacs crowns our go-to everyday cement for zirconia and emacs is therosem it's easy to clean up super simple to use um, we get very good aesthetics with it so I've got those two Emacs crowns cemented with um, Therasem now the other crowns or excuse me the other veneers we're going to place with a total etch technique universal bonding agent all bond universal air thin the bonding agent we're going to put our choice to light cured cement on the teeth seat our veneers on top of them while my assistant holds I floss down and pull out each contact before I light cure Occasionally, I'll do a tack cure with a two millimeter or three millimeter tack cure light tip, but in this case, I probably did not do that. And then we're going to finish our cleanup, then light cure everything very well. So again, those are two Emacs crowns on the anterior tee, on the two central incisors, but then uh, veneers on the rest of them. Now you can see that there's a little bit of uh, color difference, especially on the cuspids, which to me looks nice, looks natural to me. Uh, but again, this is how we did the case with their stem and choice two is our cement. Great tissue response, not perfect in every place. We've got some papillas that have been lost a little bit there, blunted in the front. Um, but very good bio-friendly materials is what we're trying to use here. So there's our final result. Okay. So again, the world's confusing sometimes. You know, like sometimes things don't make sense to me. And in my world, um, I try as hard as I can to do the best job that I can according to the situation. To every, every case is different, I know that, but I'm not trying to have different cements or different techniques for every case. I'm trying to have repeatable success with materials and techniques that work very well in almost every situation, and that's what we're going for here, trying to make sure that we have um, everything that we can working together and the best possible results that we can get for our patients each and every time. Um, questions, um, please uh, feel free to ask me any questions you want to and I'll try to answer them and um, we'll go over um, some of them. So let me take a look here. Uh, can you compare the color of Therasem EC Cement with a 3D Vita Master Shade? So Therasem is a uh, is a color that I wouldn't compare to any of those. Um, there are other cements on the market that are more aesthetic, there's no question about it, but for traditional everyday crown and bridge where the film thickness is, is decent and your materials are somewhat opaque, even anterior zirconia, uh, Therasem is a wonderful material to use. It does not influence the final color of our crowns. Another question, we mill out our crowns, either zirconia or Emacs. When I cement the zirconia with Unisem, most patients complain of post-op sensitivity. Are there any sensitivity issues with Therasem? Okay, so like I can sit here and lie to you and tell you that I never ever get post-op sensitivity and every patient loves me and all my online reviews are five star. So let me be real honest with you. There is nothing that gives you no sensitivity and the reason that is is because sometimes, remember, we're doing crowns on teeth that are damaged. We don't do crowns on totally healthy teeth. We do crowns on teeth that are broken, decayed, or have large restorations in them. We don't do crowns on teeth that are, are totally uh, perfect to begin with. At least we shouldn't be. Therefore, anytime we do work on a tooth, even from any preparation, we can cause a bit of tissue inflammation in the pulp. So all I'm saying to you is Therasem gives us the least amount of sensitivity we've ever seen in any cement that we've ever used. Um, however, there is an occasional sensitivity, but it is not because of the cement, I'm almost assured in almost all of these um, cases. What is the brand, brand of the collagen tape? Uh, there's all kinds of collagen tapes out there. I'm just gonna tell you to Google it. And uh, um, I use the least expensive collagen tape I, I can find. I usually get it in rectangular pieces. Uh, each piece of collagen tape Cost somewhere between $25 and $50, I'm just going to say, uh, somewhere in that range. But if you look hard, uh, you'll find some for a bit cheaper than that on the Internet. So, uh, again, I will let you do your research on that. Um, after removing the temporaries, what do you do to prepare the natural teeth for use with Therasem? Okay, so let me ask you a question. When you cement crowns, do you numb the patient? 
Most of us don't. Okay, so for a routine crown, for instance, on tooth number 19, patient came in for a crown prep, you did a great prep, you did an impression, you put a temporary on, you have the patient back two weeks later. You pop the temporary off, you clean the tooth, and then you cement the crown, but you don't numb the patient. Not, almost none of us do. Now, it probably would be best to numb the patient, to use pumice, 2% chlorhexidine, maybe gluma, and then use bonding agent on the tooth, but we don't. So we're looking for simplicity. When I cement my temporary crowns, we use a non-eugenol zinc oxide cement. So we use a cement that is zinc oxide based with no eugenol. And literally when we take the temporary off, we most all of the temporary cement comes inside the temporary crown and there's very little left on the tooth. We usually just have to wipe that off with a uh, two by two like I showed you before. Occasionally we'll use a 204 s scaler or a CH3 Explorer to peel a little bit off of a composite on the tooth. In other words, if the composite buildup was on there, sometimes the cement will stick to that. The temporary cement we use the most often is zone free. Zone free is a material, um, I think it's from Pentron. It used to be from a little company called Dux, D-U-X, but I think it's Pentron now. And uh, it works very well. So we just literally wipe the tooth off, try the crown in, clean the crown, and stick it on there with Therosem. That is very, very dependable. And again, the reason is, is most of us don't numb the patient. Um, so that's normally how we do that. Therosem is very compatible with Emacs. I'm reading another question. But what is the retention success of Therosem on posterior molars versus bonding Emacs to the teeth? When you use a separate bonding agent and a dual cure resin cement, you're gonna get a higher bond to the tooth. So if we were to add a bonding agent, for instance, All Bond Universal, to Therosem, we would get a higher bond to the tooth. But if we were to put a universal bonding agent on the tooth without numbing the patient, universal bonding agents are usually very pretty acidic, pH of around four, maybe a little bit more, um, we're gonna send the patient out of the chair if we put a universal bonding agent on the tooth without numbing the patient. The return of success is great for lithium disilicate and Emacs using Therosem as long as your preparation is sufficient. In other words, great bonding cannot overcome a poor prep like we started out saying in the beginning. Um, our, retentive, our retention has been way over 98% over five years. Um, I'm just saying that these materials work very well. If your prep is good, if your prep is bad, um, I think you need to pray over it because it doesn't matter what cement you use, to be honest with you. Uh, can you recommend a good, strong, and easy to clean up temporary resin cement? Well, um, like I said, zone free is the temporary cement we use the most. Um, it is a wonderful product. I don't, I'm, I'm sure there's other great temporary cements on the market. We've used many of them um, as I've tested products over the years, uh, but um, zone free to us is the best thing that we've seen. Uh, okay, so here we go. A question about an endotreated tooth. So if you're going to clean a tooth before you cement a crown, so let's back up a little bit. I cemented some veneers a few minutes ago and I used pumice on the tooth. If you're going to do maximum adhesion, for instance with veneers, and you want to clean the tooth as good as you can to get the best bond you possibly can, we use flower pumice with a couple of drops of 2% chlorhexidine, not, not mouth rinse, but 2% chlorhexidine. Um, we use cavity cleanser from Bisco, a couple of drops in flower pumice, and we clean the tooth with the flower pumice. We never use Profi paste to clean a tooth before we uh, cement a crown or bond a veneer, ever. And the reason is because Profi paste have fluoride and flavoring agents, and those flavoring agents might be oils or some other chemical that might interfere with your bond. So again, if we're gonna clean a tooth, then we are going to use flower pumice, and then um, we're gonna cement it uh, with a bonding agent and a, a resin. What do we cement uh, zirconia with if our prep's poor? So let's go for maximum adhesion here. Let's just say that we have a upper second molar, lower second molar, very short clinical crown, our retention is just not that good, or we're doing a long span bridge. Let's say that we use a zirconia crown on a poorly prepped tooth or a long span bridge and we want maximum adhesion. We try in our restoration, 
we take it out, clean it with Zero Clean, rinse it off, and then we apply a metal primer to the zirconia. So if you want maximum bond to zirconia, we want to clean the zirconia first and then a metal, a metal primer. And we use Z-Prime from Visco on there and we air thin the Z-Prime. Now we're ready to cement. Then we cement it with Therosem. Then we get maximum adhesion to the zirconia itself. Um, let's see here. Lots of questions. I appreciate the questions because I know you're listening. I mean, like I've got a Peloton class to do in a few minutes. I can't be here all night, but no, I'm just kidding. Great questions. What is the brand of the collagen tape again? Again, I'll let you do your research on that. There's many great companies. Um, I know we didn't have a whole lot of time to talk about the grafting. Um, on the case that we did layered zirconia or full coverage crowns on seven and 10, Emax veneers on the others, why didn't you do crowns uh, as well on the other teeth? So again, I did four full crowns because I had to. There was a bunch of interproximal decay um, there was um, reasons to do crowns on the incisors. Why didn't I just cut down the cuspid and the first bicuspid and do full crowns on those as well? Um, because I am as conservative as you can be. And so I save as much tooth structure as I can when I can. And to me, um, one of the best services to a patient is a veneer still. And if we can just have, if we can have our prep almost on total uh, enamel, and do a total edge technique and a bonding agent um, and a light cure cement. That is a great service for the patient. So the question is, why didn't I just crown all those teeth instead of veneers on four of the teeth and crowns on the other? Because I know I can get a good result doing it both ways, and my lab does a very good job on doing veneers next to crowns. Um, again, it's about the preparation and doing photos to show the lab how opaque of a material to use. Um, Question, why not cement an Emax veneer uh, with a good flowable? That's a great question. Uh, so generally speaking, flowable composites and uh, veneer cements are very similar. But I will say this, as much as I love flowables, and I even teach on them quite often, um, flowables I probably use too much in practice. And I have cemented some veneers with flowable. However, the handling, the viscosity of the flowable, um, no matter what flowable I use, um, the veneer looting cements, even Variolink, in this case it was Choice 2 from Bisco, they grab onto the veneer and keep it held to the tooth without me watching the veneer drift off the tooth. Um, so the viscosity on the materials matters a whole lot, along with my preparation and how the lab made the veneer. That's why I prefer a um, veneer uh, or light cure um, cement on the anterior teeth. Uh, for veneers. Now, if for veneers, we've even used a composite warmer and used a regular nano hybrid composite to cement veneers. Look, I'm going for all that. All of that probably works out fine. For me, it's handling, color, and um, how well the material cleans up. And that's really what I'm going for on a veneer cement, especially. Another question if you're cleaning a temporary cement from, let's see, okay, that's a similar question as before. Uh, to, to do, let me see here. Can you feather edge the margins for a zirconia crown like you can for gold? Uh, the answer is yes. You can feather edge any zirconia crown you want, but we don't. I provide a chamfer rounded shoulder type margin for my zirconia crowns, half, a half to one millimeter rounded shoulder or chamfer. There's a bunch of reasons why. First of all, I don't want my crown to be over contoured at the margin. And whenever you have a feather edge, it almost has to be over contoured. Secondly, I would rather me pick my margin than the ceramist. And as good as my ceramists are, I would rather have control over where the margins go. And so those are the reasons that I don't um, just do a feather edge on all of the crowns. You know what, there's a lot of other questions. I, gosh, I appreciate it. And I thank you very much for spending your time with me tonight. Um, let me leave you with a couple of things. First of all, again, thank you very much for Catapult. Um, the best speaking bureau in dentistry and product reviewers, just some great, great guys. Uh, and thanks to Bisco for having me do this. I appreciate the trust and, and support, just incredible. Now, one last thing as far as us dentists go. Uh, dentistry's tough, I know that. And we worry so much about pleasing our patients. We work in a meticulous environment where things don't always go perfectly. So my goal in all of this is to hopefully make your life a little bit easier. Dependable, repeatable success, aesthetically oriented, um, that's my goal. 
So I'm here to answer questions anytime you need to. My website is mysmilecenter.com. We got a new website. It was just launched uh, uh, Monday of this week. And uh, so there's those few bugs still with it. But you can always email me at jgriffinjrdmd at gmail.com. And um, I'll get to your email. I'm very slow at answering emails, as some people can attest, but I will get to it at some point probably. Thank you very much for listening tonight. And um, um, have a great dental year to all of you. Take time and recharge your batteries. And uh, I look forward to meeting you down the road. Have a great good evening.